start with a chair. Let's chair it up. No, don't play here. Don't do this to me. Sinewy chrome legs. Elegant caned seat. Rich birch wood. I'm not sure I like Introducing this. Introducing the Cheska. Oh. It's like the right amount of creepy for this. I did not like the way they intro that, but what a chair. Am I right? The Cheska, also known as the B-32, B-64, if it has arms, is oh. kind of having a moment. That great chair. Full disclosure. I didn't I even realize how much I liked it. Hello from Russia. You're still in Russia? That's good to know. Wow, look at this chair. So, uh, looks like it could go anywhere, you know what I mean? I am literally sitting on one right now. Have been since at least 1999. But this chair <laughs> is more than just a throne for toddler me to practice my penmanship. It's more than a trendy decor mm. item or popular movie set. Piece. God, it goes everywhere. Piece. It's a design icon in Oof. the collections of some of the world's most major museums and considered among the most important chairs of the 20th century. I gotta century. get one. So where did this chair come from? And why is it That one's like everywhere? untouched. That one, like, that one looks like no one sat on it once. It's beautiful. What a beautiful chair. Oh, I'm going like, going wild over this chair here. The Cheska chair story begins here, Ooh. at the Bauhaus. The famed German art school slash commune slash never-ending party the slash Bauhaus. genius factory. It was founded in 1919 by this architect. That's funny, in a in Minneapolis. Your name is Morris Moss. Hey, Ali Osher. In Minneapolis, there's the, uh, a brewery called Bauhaus. My friend works there. <laughs> cool people over there. Why everyone's got this chair. Ali Osher, we're learning about chairs. You like chairs? Good. Act Walter Gropius. His goal was to merge art Gropius. and industry, creating work that was deeply modern and oh, simultaneously beautiful, functional, and reproducible, which was a pretty radical change from the exclusivity and ornamental frills of other yeah. design movements. Look at these two teapots, both from 1920s Germany. This one is beautiful, but mostly decorative. On this Bauhaus one, everything is intentional. The curved wooden handle makes pouring easy and comfortable. The slanted spout prevents drips, and it definitely looks sturdy and industrial. Yeah. Except this it's probably heavy. That's how you can that's how you know something's nice. It's when it's heavy. This teapot was handcrafted out of silver and ebony. It was wildly expensive. Still is. Holy shit. Even though Bauhaus designs looked utilitarian, most That's how you know it's nice. Most of them were basically impossible to make at scale. That is until our hero, okay. Marcel Breuer, Miss seen this chair too. That's a good chair too. Mr. Cheska chair himself stepped in and changed everything. Breuer. Breuer was an early student of the Bauhaus, Looks and funny. in 1925 he was ruminating on their whole manufacturing problem when inspiration struck. He looked at his bicycle's handlebars and realized, to paraphrase, bent tubular steel was Bauhaus as heck. It's sleek, <laughs> light, shiny, strong, and this one's a direct quote, can be bent like macaroni. First he made this chair, now known as the Vasily chair, and then a bunch of other chairs and tables and oh. stools and this, uh, couch? Oh, did you see all that? That went too quickly. And then a bunch of Let other- me... Oh yeah, these tables, I want them. They stack? Nesting tables? Chair. Oh, that's beautiful. Chairs and tables. A table, tables and a desk, and stool. Oh god! Tables and this. Uh, oh, couch. Hold, uh, do you see the chair? Uh, the rolling desk chair? chair. Slow down. Chairs and tables and stools and oh! I actually don't see any wheels, but that looks great. This uh, couch, but for Breuer, these pieces still weren't modern enough. The ultimate creation he wrote would be a chair that floated on an elastic column of air. And in 1928, Breuer had another one of those eureka moments. He flipped a stool on its side, and thus, the cantilever chair was born. <laughs> Soon after... It's, it's amazing. Just keep it simple. He debuted the B-32. And with it, he achieved the purest manifestation of Bauhaus ideals. A chair that showcased the gleaming modernity of chrome, seemed to defy the laws of gravity, and, crucially... Cool. 
only required a handful of pre-made materials to make. Soon, Tonit, a company already world famous for mass producing bent wooden chairs, was making tons of B-32s. And as other Bauhausians designed their own versions, a bunch of other tubular cantilevered chairs. But it's pretty universally held that this is the best of them. The Most best. cantilever chairs require braces, which both Always ruins the, the visual lines of the chair and makes them rigid and uncomfortable. Breuer's chair doesn't need those, thanks to its structured wooden framing, which holds everything together but still allows for flexibility and bounce. That added structure also means the chair can be made from one continuous length of steel, which is bent 16 times, rather than a bunch of different tubes fused together, which makes the chair lighter and easier to make. Plus, the cane gives the chair an airy transparency, a feature Tonit played up in their 1930s advertising, of which there was a lot. Tonit really wanted these designs to take off. The problem was they were expensive, and they seemed a little too modern for the average home. Until the 60s. Let's go. A sort of hybrid futuristic look became all the rage, and the B-32 fit in perfectly. Gavina, the go-to Italian modernist brand, began selling it, and they gave it a new name. Cesca, from Francesca, Breuer's daughter's name. As the mid-century look picked up steam, so did the Cesca. But unlike those newer designs, the Cesca wasn't copyrighted. So, manufacturers started making completely legal Cesca copies, and marketing them as Breuer-style chairs. What? Did the net know By about capitalism? By the Cheska was ubiquitous. One reviewer noted it was as common, as imitated, and as mass-produced as a pair of Calvin Klein jeans, which at the time was just wow. about the highest praise there was. After that, the Cheska never quite went away. Today, there are many places to buy one, and countless secondhand ones floating around, which only seems to drive up demand. Its appeal is only getting broader as both Bauhaus and modernism become popular again. In short, this chair is everywhere because, ever since its inception nearly a century ago, it's been a design marvel. And, quite frankly, cool as hell. Yeah. Oh. (sighs) Whoops. I could talk about chairs all day. Oh, what a good chair. I I give it a, a five out of five. Just, it, boom. You know? Incredible. Incredible. Oh. How do they not copyright it, though? I don't get it. I I, I, I want those chairs. I feel like I want a couple two tree, you know? I really like that chair. I want to, I want to sit in the chair. I'd like to sit in the chair. Oh. I'm obsessed with chairs. What about you, chat? You want to rate it? Out of five? Did you you rate it yet? Do it. (laughs) All right. I still got to figure that out. All right. Uh oh. Boof. Boof. Chat, I've just been boofed. Thank you for the 1312 biddies, Boof. Love your face. How you doing today? Less than two, you. I'm just about to end the segment. Like and subscribe and comment as well. Love your face. All right. That's the segment.